Uh, if you will turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16, we are in week two of a four-week teaching series simply called Follow Me. The man known as Polycarp, and that's an engraving of him on the screen, was born in 69 AD. In his later life, he served as the bishop, the primary pastor of a church in a city called Smyrna, which is in Western Turkey. And apart from the authors of the New Testament, he is one of the earliest uh, Christian writers whose works still survive today. Polycarp was a disciple of the apostle John, who himself was a disciple of Jesus. And according to Polycarp's own story that he told and others recorded, he became a believer in Jesus Christ due to the influence of John. He sat at his feet, he was John's disciple, and uh, he also met some of the other apostles who were part of the 12 disciples of Jesus. When he became an older adult, uh, Polycarp was appointed as this bishop to this city called Smyrna, and that's where he did most of his teaching and his writing. In 155 AD, a Roman proconsul named Lucius Quadratus, who was ruling over the province of Asia, which included the city of Smyrna, ordered the arrest and the trial of Polycarp after Polycarp publicly refused to burn incense to acknowledge the Roman emperor as a deity. At the end of his trial, the 86-year-old Polycarp was sentenced to death. Shortly after Jesus launched his ministry by being baptized in the Jordan River, he took a walk on a beach. Matthew chapter 4 tells us, while walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately, Scripture tells us they did that. So Jesus was walking down a beach. He spotted two brothers. They were fishing. He said, follow me. They left everything behind, and they fell into step behind him. And the Scriptures tell us that moments later, he made the same invitation to another pair of brothers, James and John. And then the days that immediately followed, he made the same invitation to a man named Matthew or Levi, and again to another man named Philip. And periodically throughout his ministry, he made that, that invitation to people who are both named in Scripture and who were not. In fact, follow me was one of Jesus' most repeated statements. What did Jesus mean when he said, follow me? We all have our own ideas about what he meant, but he really didn't leave the interpretation open for us to manipulate. And so for four weeks, we are unpacking what scripture tells us that Jesus meant when he said those words. One thing is definitely true. That is, Jesus never said to anyone, you get to decide what follow me means for you. Instead, like other rabbis of his day, his invitation clearly implied all you really get to decide is whether or not you will follow me on my terms or not follow me at all. There was no implied compromise. There was no implied middle ground. Last week, we talked about the difference between a Jesus follower and a Jesus fan. And I told you a Jesus fan might say, I'm willing to follow Jesus if I can keep my other options open. A Jesus fan might say, yes, I think I will follow Jesus, but I'm going to do it on my own schedule after I do the other things that I would like to do. A Jesus fan sometimes says or thinks, if this doesn't work out, if it proves too hard or too demanding or less rewarding than I expected, I want to be free to go back to my old life. 
But Jesus did not call fans. Jesus called followers. In Matthew chapter 16, it tells us in a very concise statement what Jesus required of his followers. In verse 24, it says, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Matthew tells us that Jesus was speaking to his disciples at that particular moment. And so this would be an odd thing to say to his disciples. These are people who, as far as they have decided, are already coming after Jesus, are already following him. And Jesus says, if anyone would come after me. And I would imagine that some of those men who were close to him, who had already made a commitment, were thinking to themselves, what do you mean if? Why else would we be here? But not all who believed they were followers were followers the way Jesus describes it. The Bible tells us Jesus had many disciples, and when we hear the word disciple, we automatically think of the original 12 who are named in the pages of Scripture, but there were more, both men and women. Once he actually sent out what we might call an advanced publicity team to go to the cities nearby and to tell them that he was going to come and visit them, Luke chapter 10 verse 1 says, after this the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them on ahead of him two by two into every town and place where he himself was about to go. So Jesus had 72 more committed followers that are spoken specifically in, in the pages of scripture and mark chapter 15 verse 40 and 41 actually calls out some of the women who were disciples of Jesus at the time of his crucifixion this reference points back to when they began to follow him it says there were also women looking on from a distance among whom were Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James the younger and of Joseph and Salome when he was in Galilee they followed him and ministered to to him, and there were also many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. So, in addition to the original 12, the 72 he sent out at one particular time, and this group of women who followed and ministered to him, uh, there were all kinds of other people. There were large crowds that would appear and disappear, but these crowds were completely unpredictable. When Jesus said hard things, many who believed that they were disciples disciples or followers would turn around and leave. After one particularly challenging message that talked about what was required to be a follower of Christ, John chapter 6 verse 66 says, after this many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. When the crowds grew large, Jesus thinned the herd. In my first semester of college, I took a class called Introduction to Engineering. All first semester engineering students were required to take this class regardless of engineering discipline. It was a one unit class. It met one time a week for one hour. And the first day, 200 plus students filled the auditorium. The professor told us that each lecture would consist of a local engineering professional from a different discipline who would tell us what it was like to do his job. Sounded very easy. We were told their grade would be based on one midterm and one final, and that we were required to take notes in the lectures, read the textbook, and work the workbook problems. But we covered neither the textbook nor the workbook and its problems in the class, and we were not required to submit the problems for a grade. As you can imagine, that was a very low priority for most of us. To prepare for the midterm, like most students, I reviewed my lecture notes, because that's all we talked about in class, and I showed up for the test. When the exam was handed out, it was all mathematical problems from the workbook. I did not finish a single problem on the midterm. No curve was applied. 
four students passed. I was not one of them. At our next class, the professor said, you were warned. The syllabus and I specifically said, we will cover the lectures, the textbook, and the workbook problems on the exams. You were told what it would take to pass. I had office hours every week, but you were not willing to pay the price. And if you are unwilling to pay the price to become a competent engineer, someday someone will die when your circuit or your software or your bridge fails. Today is the last day to drop the class. If you pay the price, you may still pass. Half the class changed majors. I barely survived. Jesus had lots of people who called themselves his followers, but most of them were not willing to pay the price. What was the price? Jesus said it plainly and clearly. Let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Now, when you and I read this verse, we kind of tend to break things up. We'll say, well, I see three things to do in this particular verse. Jesus said to be his disciple, I must deny myself. I must take up my cross. I must learn to follow him. And that's a convenient way to look at it, but that's really not what Jesus was saying in this particular context. What he's actually saying is the first two things, deny yourself and take up your cross, are actually one inseparable thing. And by doing those things as one inseparable thing, you accomplish the act of following me. Now, if we have a little time, uh, a little tough time wrestling with that, I thought of an example that I thought might help. Maybe it won't, but we'll see. When Janet and I got married, uh, our first two cars, my car, her car, both had manual transmissions, not automatic transmissions. And if you're young enough to have no idea what I'm talking about, just Google it. Uh, to begin moving in a car with a manual transmission, you have to do several things. You smoothly lift your left foot off of the clutch. At the same time, you are moving your right foot to the gas pedal from the brake and smoothly pressing down on the gas. Now, I just described two things, one that your left foot does and one that your right foot does, and I describe them separately. But you cannot do them separately. They are not independent actions. If you do one without the other, the car won't move. It will either stall, or your engine will race like you're a crazy person, and you will go nowhere. But by performing the two acts together, you accomplish the third act of creating acceleration. Jesus told his disciples, denying yourself and taking up your cross are the two acts that accomplish following me. And Jesus gave us a perfect example in the hours before he went to his death. Matthew chapter 26, verse 39 says that when Jesus prayed, he said this, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Jesus, in that moment, in the Garden of Gethsemane, praying before he was going to go through the agony of being tortured and crucified, denied himself, denied his own will in favor of God's will. And the next day, as part of that denial, he went to the cross. He literally took up his cross to follow God's will. For you and I, that means to follow Jesus means like him, I must deny myself and take up my cross. 
So if follow me means to deny ourselves and take up our cross like Jesus did, in what ways can we be expected to do that self-denial and that cross-lifting? The key to really understanding this little segment of scripture, I believe, is the context that appears before and after it. Matthew chose these particular vignettes in chapter 16 on purpose to set the stage for Jesus's statement about what it means to follow him. There are four brief conversations that precede this in chapter 16. And I want us to look at all four very quickly. The first conversation, pardon me, the first conversation is found in chapter 16, verses one to four. It says, and the Pharisees and Sadducees came and to test Jesus, they asked him to show them a sign from heaven. He answered them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be stormy today for the sky is red and threatening. You know how to interpret the appearance of the sky but you cannot interpret the signs of the times. An evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. So he left them and departed. Religious leaders asked Jesus for a sign to prove who he was. Did they need a sign? No, they did not. As Jewish scholars, they knew scripture. In fact, many of these men probably had humongous sections of what we would call the Old Testament memorized word for word. They knew exactly what the Messiah would do when he came. And they knew Jesus was doing it. The signs were already present. They did not need a personal sign. But the religious leaders live by an unspoken principle, which says, most of scripture doesn't really apply to me. I'm a pretty good person. I don't really need this. This is for the little people. I don't have to obey it personally unless God confirms it to me personally, unless he gives me a sign that I am also meant to take this for myself. And the truth is that many of us in this room live by that same principle. When our two older children were younger, they often made it their mission to annoy and harass each other. And I'm sure none of you parents have had that experience in your household. Uh, but sometimes Janet and I would look at one of them and say, stop doing that to your sibling. And we would turn our backs and the other one would do exactly the same thing to his or her sibling. The one who had not been admonished did not take the sign personally. And so we had to give them a personal sign. We say sometimes, I know Jesus said lots of things. I know he said to care for the poor, but I don't think he meant that for me personally. I work hard for what I have. I don't think I really should be giving it to other people. Or we say, I know Jesus said to forgive, but she hasn't shown any remorse. And if I let her off the hook, she'll never learn how wrong she really is. Or I know Jesus said to tell other people about him, about what he's done for me, but that makes me so uncomfortable. So here's what I'll do. If God confirms he meant for me to obey those commands personally, if he gives me my own sign, like an undeniably strong feeling that I should do it, or a friend who just happens to verbally suggest it, then I'll know he meant it for me too. I've been guilty of that. Have you? Jesus said, a real follower of mine denies himself and takes up his cross. He does what I say because I commanded all my followers to do the same thing without asking for unique and personal confirmation. 
Many of us in this room have been Christians for a very, very long time, and we know a lot of things that Jesus said to do. Are we actually doing them? Or are we waiting for a personal sign that says, yes, I meant you too. To deny myself and take up my cross, I relinquish my need for personal confirmation. The second conversation is found in verses 5 through 12. Jesus was speaking to, to his disciples shortly after he had this conversation with the religious leaders, and they were crossing the Sea of Galilee. It says, when the disciples reached the other side, they had forgotten to bring any bread. Jesus said to them, watch and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And the disciples began discussing it among themselves, saying, it's because we brought no bread. Skip ahead to verse 11. Jesus said, how is it that you fail to understand that I did not speak about bread? Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Then they understood that he did not tell them to beware of the leaven of bread, but of the teaching of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So Jesus told his disciples, beware of the teaching of these men who are religious leaders. Now, he wasn't talking about bewaring ac accurate biblical teaching. What he was talking about is beware the man-made additions, the rules, the subconsciously inserted behaviors that they add to God's word. Rules like since God said, do no work on the Sabbath, you can't help a person in need if that would require you to do something that looks like work on the Sabbath. The religious leaders made rules like that, not out of a desire to follow God wholeheartedly, but out of a desire to excuse their lack of love for God and for other people. And Jesus actually called their teachings, that kind of teaching, hypocrisy. Luke chapter 12, verse one says this, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. On the outside, these religious leaders displayed extraordinary conformity to God's law. And they believe that alone proved they were true followers of God. But on the inside, their hearts toward God and other people were hard and unfeeling. And their man-made rules were like leaven or yeast. They permeated Jewish society the way that yeast, when left in bread, will permeate the entire ball of dough. People used their rules to justify their own selfishness and their own hypocrisy, believing that they too could conform outwardly to a set of rules without ever demonstrating a change of heart. And in the church, we have lots of subtle man-made rules by which we measure our rightness with God. Sometimes we're not even particularly overtly aware that these are running through our heads, but we think things like, I'm a truer follower of God because I read a better Bible translation or I'm a truer follower of God because I don't listen to or sing songs that aren't the right flavor of Christian music, or I'm a truer follower of God because I give to the right charities, or I'm a truer follower of God because I know how to dress the right way and eat the right things and play the right games and speak the right phrases and vote the right way. It doesn't really matter if I have no real genuine affection for God or other people. I've got this thing nailed. That makes me a true follower. Jesus said, that's hypocrisy. Jesus said, a real follower of mine denies herself and takes up her cross. She gives up measuring her status with God by her outward conformity to rules and instead pursues a genuine affectionate love for God himself and for other people, even those with whom she disagrees. 
do you and I have a genuine, measurable love for God and for people outside of our affinity circle? To deny myself and take up my cross, I relinquish my rules and I practice love. The third conversation is found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 17. It says, now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of of the living God. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, or Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. As Jesus taught and healed, all kinds of speculation and rumors about his identity were swirling among the crowds. And so he asked his disciples, who are people saying that I am? John the Baptist had been executed sometime in the previous couple of years. And so some thought that maybe God had sent him back to wreak judgment on the Romans. Others knew that scripture promised Elijah would return before the day of judgment. So they thought Jesus might be him. Malachi chapter four, verse five says, behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord. Still others hearing the kind of things that Jesus said, thought he must be one of those doom saying prophets like Jeremiah and some of the minor prophets. So Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you did not discern this yourself. My father made you understand this. Why was this claim so significant? Most of the rest of Jesus's alleged followers in the crowds were following someone they believed to be a prophet. An amazing one, but still a prophet. But crowds don't follow prophets to become like the prophets. They follow prophets to hear and see unusual things. And then in most cases, they go home and return to living the way that they always had. But Peter and the other disciples realized Jesus was far more than just a prophet. He was the Christ. He was the Messiah. He was the anointed one. He was the son of the living God. He was the promised king of of kings and Lord of lords. When a prophet speaks, you can, if you wish, walk away unchanged. But when the son of the living God, the king of kings, points to you and says, you follow me, your life is his. As professing Christians, we would all probably say to Jesus, if he asked, who do you say I am? You are the Christ, the son of the living God. But more often than not, we don't treat him that way, do we? We treat him like he's just another prophet, a teacher, a life coach who dispenses tools that we weigh and say, I'll use that one, but I won't use that one. Once a week, we listen to him speak to us out of his word. And then in most cases, like the people of Jesus's day, we go back home and live the way we always have. Jesus says a real follower of mine denies himself and takes up his cross. He gives up his own agenda, his own dreams, perhaps his focus even on his family or his home and his career. He stops making them his top priorities and instead makes the top priority of his life the service of the king. Many of us sitting in here today have been Christians for a long time, but our top priorities are still our own. Have you ever made your top priority priority 
the service of the king. To deny myself and take up my cross, I relinquish my life to the service of the king. And the fourth conversation is found in Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 to 23. It says, from that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. When Jesus told his disciples that God had planned for him to suffer and die and be resurrected, they were distressed. And Peter lectured Jesus. He pulled him aside. He said, that's wrong, Jesus, and I will make sure that never happens. Peter had plans Jesus would defeat the Romans, he would reestablish God's kingdom in Israel. And Peter would play a role in that. And he was not ready to give up that plan to deny himself and take up his cross. He'd worked hard. He'd served Jesus faithfully. He was entitled to a better result. Jesus answered, you are setting your mind on the things of man, not God. As Christians, you and I often feel entitled to better results. I went to college, God. I should have a better job. I exercised and I ate right. I should have better health. I didn't sleep around before I got married. I should have a hot spouse. Wow, there's some agreement out there, isn't there? I worked hard. I deserve financial security. I parented well. I should have good kids. I voted right. I deserve a better government. I did the right things, God. I deserve a good life. And Jesus, anything else is wrong, and I will make sure it doesn't happen. What would Jesus say? You are a hindrance to me. Your mind is set on the things of man, not the things of God. If you want to follow me, you must deny yourself and take up your cross. To deny myself and take up my cross I must relinquish my need to control the outcomes. In 155 AD, Polycarp, at the age of 86, was taken to trial, was accused of blasphemy because he did not honor the God who was the Roman emperor, and he was sentenced to death. Before the sentence was carried out, he was given one more opportunity to burn incense to the emperor. If Polycarp had been a man whose primary focus was to control the outcomes, he would have capitulated on the spot to spare his own life. But instead, he said, 86 years have I served the Lord and he has done me no wrong. How can I blaspheme my king and my savior? You threaten me with fire that burns for a season and is quenched. You are ignorant of the fire of everlasting punishment prepared for the wicked. And as he was led away, he turned back and said, I bless you, Father, for judging me worthy of this hour, so that in the company of the martyrs, I may share the cup of Christ. Polycarp's 
deaf as a martyr, burned at the stake, and speared because he did not die fast enough, inspired thousands of people in his lifetime and thousands more who have read his story to consider the claims of Jesus Christ, to ask themselves, is this a person whom I should follow? To follow Jesus, we must not become fans, but like Polycarp, we must become fellows with Jesus, servants of the Father like him, willing to deny ourselves and take up our crosses. We must give up what we think we possess, we own, we're entitled to, to gain what only God can give. After Jesus said to his disciples, deny your cross or deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. He said these words, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man or a woman if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul. Have you denied yourself and taken up your cross? It's not just a one-time decision. It's an everyday thing for a follower of Jesus. Will you stand with me? Before I pray, I do wanna invite you if you're so inclined to join a group that includes people from our church and several other churches in the area, every Sunday we're praying at a local school that God will make some extraordinary changes in the lives of people. Today we'll be at Elizabeth High School at one o'clock for 30 minutes only. We're gonna gather around the, the flagpole and we're gonna pray not only for the school and for the area, but for God to do some incredible things in this greater community and in our world. And so I invite you to come out, even if you just pray silently, it would be extraordinary to fill that area around the flag with people from many churches. And so please consider being a part of that. Would you bow your heads with me? Father God, we thank you for the fact that Jesus offers eternal life to us. He offers so many extraordinary benefits but they are not things that come without responsibilities. They are not things that come without a commitment. We cannot earn our salvation, Lord. We are completely and fully aware of that. And yet Jesus didn't call anyone to simply coast. He called us to give up what we think we deserve in order to accomplish what he knows is best. Lord, make us people who deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. We pray this in the name of the one who makes that possible, your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great one. We'll see you next time.